Everyone's jumping on the electric bandwagon, promising silent operation, zero emissions, and maintenance-free boating paradise. Marine dealers are pushing these things harder than politicians push promises during election season. However, the reality floating beneath those glossy brochures tells a completely different story. The fundamental physics of battery technology, combined with the brutal marine environment and actual boating usage patterns, creates a perfect storm of compromises that most buyers don't discover until they're thousands of dollars deep and stuck at the dock or worse, out at sea. Here's one design disaster nobody mentions. The elephant in the engine well. Electric outboards fundamentally misunderstand what boats need because they're designed by people who think in terms of cars, not marine applications. A car sits in your garage. A boat lives in one of the most hostile environments on Earth. The battery housing uses the same weatherproofing as expensive electronics, which sounds great until you remember that boats don't just get wet. They get submerged, pounded by waves, pressure washed, left in rain, baked in sun, frozen in winter, and generally abused. Most manufacturers seal battery compartments with gaskets and O-rings, the same technology that's been failing on boats since they were invented. Weight distribution creates another nightmare dealers forget to mention. Traditional gas outboards concentrate weight low and toward the transom, exactly where you want it. Electric outboards put massive battery packs either in the motor or somewhere in the boat, fundamentally changing weight distribution. A typical electric trolling motor might weigh 30 pounds, but add the lithium batteries and you're adding another 100 pounds minimum, usually exactly where it shouldn't go. Talking about not going. The propeller design on most electric outboards is optimized for low speed efficiency because they can't compete on top speed or range. That sounds smart until you realize the prop design is completely wrong for any other speed range. You're buying a motor excellent at one specific task and mediocre at everything else. The control systems represent another area where cost cutting meets complexity. Most electric outboards use brushless motors, which require electronic speed controllers that are essentially small computers exposed to marine conditions. These ESCs generate significant heat, require active cooling, and represent single points of failure that can't be field repaired. But weight problems are nothing compared to what happens when you actually try to use these things on the water. The industry loves to throw around equivalent horsepower numbers that are absolutely meaningless in real-world applications. They'll tell you their 3 kilowatt motor performs like a 6 to 9 horsepower gas outboard, which is technically based on the instant torque advantage electric motors have. The problem is that advantage only matters for acceleration and low-speed maneuvering, not for sustained performance. Battery capacity is measured in kilowatt hours, and here's where the math gets painful. A typical high-end electric outboard might come with a 5 kilowatt hour battery pack. Running at full throttle, that motor might draw 3 kilowatts continuously, giving you less than 2 hours of runtime. But marine batteries shouldn't be discharged below 20% capacity for longevity, so you're really working with 4 kilowatt hours of usable capacity. Factor in cold weather degradation and battery aging, and you're looking at maybe 90 minutes of actual usable runtime on a brand new system. Speaking of cold weather, lithium batteries lose capacity progressively as temperatures drop, maintaining about 95% at freezing but dropping to around 80% at 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Some electric outboards include battery heating systems, which is great except it uses battery power to heat the battery, creating parasitic drain. Top speed limitations aren't just about battery technology, they're about fundamental physics. Lithium batteries have hard limits on discharge rates, push too much current too fast and you risk thermal runaway. This is why most electric outboards have power limiting software that restricts maximum output well below theoretical capacity. And if you think the performance numbers are bad, wait until you hear about the real maintenance nightmare. Here's something most dealers won't tell you until after you've signed the paperwork. Electric outboards don't eliminate maintenance, they just change what kind of maintenance you're doing and make it way more expensive when things go wrong. The zero maintenance claim is one of the biggest lies in marine marketing today. Battery maintenance starts the moment you install the system. 
Lithium batteries require specific charging protocols, storage temperatures, and discharge management to maintain longevity. Leave your batteries discharged over winter and you've significantly reduced their lifespan. Let them get too hot in summer storage and same problem. The battery management system handles some of this automatically, but you still need to maintain proper storage conditions and monitor cell health regularly. Most manufacturers recommend monthly charging cycles even during storage seasons. Charging time is where electric outboard owners develop a deep relationship with patience. Most systems charge at rates between 500 watts to 1 kilowatt unless you invest in commercial fast charging infrastructure. That 5 kilowatt hour battery pack? 5 to 10 hours to fully recharge from a standard outlet. Fast charging options can cut this to 2 or 3 hours, but these cost additional thousands and require 240 volt circuits and marine electrical upgrades at your dock. Speaking of battery replacement, let's talk about the cost nobody mentions in the showroom. Lithium iron phosphate batteries, which are commonly used in marine applications, are rated for 2,000 to 4,000 charge cycles before capacity drops to 80% of original. Sounds like a lot until you realize that if you're an active boater doing 50 trips per season, assuming you maintain proper charging habits and don't stress the batteries, the replacement cost anywhere from $3,000 to $8,000, depending on capacity. Some manufacturers don't sell replacement batteries directly to consumers, forcing you to go through dealers at dealer markup prices. The connection points between motor and battery represent constant maintenance concerns because marine environments love corroding electrical connections. Even with gold-plated connectors and dielectric grease, you're fighting a losing battle against moisture and salt. These aren't simple spark plug wires. These are high-current, low-voltage connections requiring specific tools and knowledge of high-current DC systems. The maintenance issues are real, but they pale compared to how electric outboards perform in actual boating conditions. Watching electric outboard marketing videos is like watching a cooking show where everything comes out perfect. They show calm waters, sunny days, light boats, and short trips. What they don't show you is sitting at the dock for six hours waiting for your battery to charge because you miscalculated your range. The silent operation benefit is real, but it comes with unintended consequences. Yes, electric motors are quiet, which is great for fishing or enjoying nature, but that silence means other boaters can't hear you coming, creating collision risks. It also means you can't hear problems developing in your motor like you can with gas engines. The zero emissions claim needs massive asterisks. Yes, your boat produces zero emissions, but that electricity came from somewhere. Depending on your local power grid, you might be burning coal to charge your batteries. Just moving the emissions from your transom to a smokestack miles away. Range anxiety isn't just for electric cars. It's worse on the water because you can't just pull over and call for help. Getting towed costs serious money, assuming anyone's around to tow you. The psychological stress of constantly monitoring battery level and calculating remaining range turns relaxing boat trips into stressful math exercises. The infrastructure problem hits hard when you want to go anywhere beside your home dock. Most marinas don't have charging infrastructure for electric boats. Planning a weekend trip to a different lake? Better hope they have charging available. Water intrusion is the silent killer of electric outboards. Unlike gas outboards where a little water might cause hard starting, water in electric motor electronics usually means catastrophic failure. The motor housing might be waterproof when new, but shaft seals wear, gaskets compress, and mounting bolts work loose. Software updates represent a new maintenance burden traditional outboard owners never faced. Electric outboards run firmware controlling everything from throttle response to battery management. Manufacturers regularly release updates to fix bugs or improve performance. Miss an update and you might be running outdated software with known issues. Corrosion affects electric outboards differently than gas motors, but no less severely. The prop shaft and mounting hardware corrode just like traditional motors, but electric motors also have large heat sinks for cooling electronics, and these aluminium fins corrode aggressively in salt water. So who should actually buy these things? The answer might surprise you, and it's probably not you. Now here's where we get real about who electric outboards actually work for. Despite everything I've told you, they do work for specific people in specific situations. The problem is those people represent maybe 5% of recreational boaters. 
The ideal electric outboard customer owns a small boat, like a 12-foot dinghy or lightweight fishing boat that stays within two miles of their dock. They make short trips, don't mind slow speeds, have reliable charging infrastructure at home, and aren't bothered by long charging times. They boat in areas with calm water, predictable weather, and minimal current. They also have enough disposable income to absorb high initial cost and eventual battery replacement. They genuinely care about quiet operation for fishing or wildlife observation. They use their boat maybe 10 to 20 times per season. Let's get specific about what actually works. A boat under 14 feet with a displacement hull running a 3 kilowatt motor at trolling speeds of 2 to 4 miles per hour can realistically expect 3 to 5 hours of runtime from a 2 kilowatt hour battery pack. That's perfect for a morning fishing session on a small lake. Your total investment might be $4,000 for motor and battery, versus $1,500 for a comparable gas setup. Over eight years of casual use, assuming you avoid the battery replacement by staying within recommended charge cycles, the numbers almost work out when you factor in zero fuel costs. The math changes completely when you scale up. A 16-foot boat trying to plane with a 6-kilowatt motor will drain that same 2-kilowatt-hour battery in under 40 minutes at full throttle. Now you need a 10-kilowatt-hour battery pack, pushing your investment to $12,000 or more. That's when Electric stops making any financial sense whatsoever. If you live on a quiet lake, own a small bass boat or pontoon, and primarily fish within sight of your dock, an electric outboard might genuinely work for you. If you're using it as a secondary motor for a dinghy or tender for short trips from your anchored boat to shore, it could be appropriate. If you have a very specific use case like guiding fly fishing trips where absolute silence is worth any price, it might make sense. But here's who should absolutely not buy electric outboards, and this is most people. Anyone who boats more than a few miles from their launch point, anyone who fishes all day or takes extended cruises, anyone who boats in areas with current, tide, or changing weather, anyone who can't afford a three to eight thousand dollar battery replacement in ten to twenty years, anyone who uses their boat as primary transportation to fishing spots, Anyone who boats in cold climates where battery performance drops significantly. Anyone who doesn't have reliable charging at their dock. Understanding who shouldn't buy them leads us to the fundamental flaws that will never be fixed. Let's bring this all together, because we need to understand why electric outboards aren't just temporarily flawed technology waiting for batteries to improve. Some of these problems are fundamental physics that no amount of engineering can overcome. Energy density is the killer. Gasoline contains about 12 kilowatt hours of energy per kilogram. Lithium batteries contain about 0.25 kilowatt hours per kilogram. That's a 48 to 1 difference that no amount of improvement will ever close because we're comparing chemical energy to electrochemical energy. Even if battery technology doubles or triples in the next decade, gasoline will still hold 10 to 15 times more energy per pound. To put this in perspective, 5 gallons of gasoline weighs about 30 pounds and contains roughly 200 kilowatt hours of usable energy. To match that energy in lithium batteries, you'd need 800 pounds of battery pack. That's more than most small boats weigh empty. This isn't a problem you can engineer around. It's physics, and physics doesn't care about your marketing budget. The marine environment will always be hostile to electronics. You can improve sealing and use better materials, but you're still putting sensitive electronics in one of the most corrosive environments on Earth. Gas outboards survive because their critical components are mechanical and can handle water intrusion better than circuit boards. The usage patterns don't match the technology. Boaters want to go fast sometimes, cruise efficiently sometimes, and have unlimited range whenever needed. Electric motors can do one of these things, maybe two with serious compromises, but they can't do all three. The infrastructure will lag behind adoption for decades. Marinas operate on thin margins and won't invest in expensive charging infrastructure without clear demand. Current estimates suggest less than 2% of marinas nationwide have any electric boat charging capability. This means most boaters won't have access to away-from-home charging for many years. 
The cost structure doesn't favor electric. Gas outboards spread their cost over the entire lifespan. A $1,500 gas outboard running for 15 years costs about $100 per year. Electric outboards front load the cost at $4,000 to $8,000, then hit you with a battery replacement of $3,000 to $8,000 every 10 to 20 years. The total cost of ownership over 20 years runs two to three times higher than the equivalent gas power. So what's the bottom line on electric outboards? Here's what you actually need to know. If you want to see more truth about what dealers won't tell you, check out my video on the shocking truth behind banned two-stroke engines. Look, I'm not against electric outboards out of some loyalty to gas engines. I'm against misleading marketing that sells people expensive equipment that won't meet their needs. The technology will improve, batteries will get better, charging will get faster, and systems will become more reliable. But the fundamental physics limitations aren't going away. If you're in that narrow slice of boaters for whom electric makes sense, go for it with open eyes. But if you're buying because a dealer convinced you it's the future, you're probably going to regret that decision halfway through your first season.